Coming up today, the stock market pulls back. Is it disconnected from reality? The China risk? Shopify smashes expectations? Bitcoin continues its rally? The latest results from Tiger Brokers? And why stock market bubbles and crashes are a good thing? You don't want to miss this one, guys. Let's go. Well, it's no real surprise the stock market takes a little bit of a breather today here, isn't it? After quite a strong rally. Over the past week, however, the good news is it's still on a bit of a defensive rotation. REITs and healthcare and staples. Still the weakest sector. We've still got oil and gold coming off and international stocks especially as well. Ever since the election, the rest of the world has underperformed. We had small caps pull back a little bit here today. And even though all the indices finished lower, along with most sectors, volatility didn't increase. In fact, the VIX came down. As volatility continues to get sucked out of this market, I'm expecting the VIX to come come down to a 12 handle by the end of this month, if not early December. We also had volatility sucked out of the bond market and the oil market as well. Markets breathing a sign of relief after the election. Still got bond yields trading really firm here. 10 year at 442. And stick with me today because I'll make a case to you later why stock market bubbles and crashes are actually a good thing, contrary to popular belief and the desire to limit them. I'll also give you an update on Tiger Brokers and their latest earnings results, along with some interesting developments on the cannabis trade today as well. First, just carrying on from the biggest story yesterday, Bitcoin and its monster move up. Overnight, we actually got up above $90,000 a coin for the first time. Absolute melt up mode here as it continues its march onto $100,000 a coin. And that's helped carry the likes of Dogecoin. Now currently with a $55 billion market capitalization, making that mean coin's value larger than that of Ford Motor, which has a market cap of $44 billion. And Michael Saylor, the guy behind MicroStrategy, who seems to crack the code to infinite riches. Sell debt, buy Bitcoin, go on podcasts all day, convince others to do the same, corner the market, drive the price of Bitcoin up, rinse and repeat, sell more debt, buy more Bitcoin. Pretty sure he's going to keep doing that as long as the market allows him. And it's going to be interesting to see if Bitcoin does go ballistic, million dollars a coin, micro strategy, who knows, may get to a market cap of a trillion. And he all have set a record for creating the most amount of wealth just by cornering a finite asset, not actually delivering a product or service to consumers. Either way, it seems to be working for him and micro strategy shareholders at this point of time. Because after we just got news of him yesterday, adding another 27,200 Bitcoin to micro strategies reserves, they're now holding 279,420 with his average cost per Bitcoin at $42,692. If Bitcoin were to go below that figure again, his reserves would be showing a loss. And I'd say if it went below 30,000, 25,000, he might get in a bit of trouble with his finances, not to mention equity holders as well. However, let's try and work out a value for MicroStrategy using their 279,420 Bitcoin. So 279,420 Bitcoin, currently Bitcoin priced at 88,331. So to work out the value of MicroStrategy's Bitcoin holding, we multiply that by the current price of Bitcoin, 100,000 million billion, 24.6 billion is MicroStrategy's current Bitcoin holdings value, mark to market, 24.6 billion. Now let's work out what MicroStrategy's business might be worth just looking at their sales, which have actually been flat over the last five years. So I wouldn't give them exactly a premium price to sales ratio. However, let's give them an industry average price to sales ratio of 4.71 for the software industry. So using their last trailing 12 months revenue, 496 million, let's be generous and round it up to 500 million, multiplied by a price to sales ratio of 4.71. So let's assume their underlying legacy software business is worth 2.3 billion. So 2.3 billion valuation on their business, plus the 24.6 billion in mark to market value of their Bitcoin on their balance sheet gives us combined market cap fair value of 26.9 billion. Let's just round that up to 27 billion. Currently their market cap 72 billion, 72 divided by 27, 2.66. The market's currently given MicroStrategy 166% premium over their mark to market value Bitcoin holdings. In other words, investors in MicroStrategy shares are willing to pay more than $2 for every dollar in Bitcoin value that they hold because their business is flatlining. It's going nowhere for the last five years. All their focus is on hodling Bitcoin. And like I've said before, this has happened before. Back in the late 90s, he did a similar style pump which believe it or not, price only took out the highs that MicroStrategy reached in early 2000 yesterday. So anybody buying MicroStrategy up here, they're gonna need a lot of luck in my opinion and Bitcoin to keep rocketing along with the market, keep willing to assign a huge premium over top of their actual underlying holdings. Otherwise we may be setting up for a repeat of 2000. In my opinion, a much safer bet would be the iShares Bitcoin Trust, which pretty much matches one for one the underlying Bitcoin holdings. And long-term that should hold up better than MicroStrategy, especially when Bitcoin eventually does have a pullback and its next bear market as well. MicroStrategy will most likely get crushed. I wouldn't be surprised to see it down 80, 90% 
in the next Bitcoin bear market. But anyway, we'll keep an eye on all that. Certainly plenty of momentum and volumes in this sector. And I'd agree with the narrative of this article that Bitcoin has been the best barometer of animal spirits ever since we've had the election. Even volatility adjusted, it has outperformed the rest of the pack. Small caps, regional banks, it's been absolutely lit up. And sometimes the consensus does play out. So does the technical analysis. And a lot of us are expecting it should hit $100,000 a coin by the end of the year. It's just hard to see a catalyst that would really knock it over at this point point of time, maybe potentially a fight with the SEC or some other agency and the new incoming administration that could potentially cause some volatility. However, there's no signs of that just yet. Looks to be a clean slate. That's why we've got some like market veteran Ed Yardini boosting his forecast for the roaring 20s. He thinks the S&P 500 will be up 66% by the end of the decade and that it'll hit 10,000 and that the market's euphoria will continue amid favorable policies and a potential end to geopolitical conflict under a new president. His forecast comes amid a slew of increased optimism among top minds on Wall Street. And the fact is we're already seeing early green shoots that Americans might be feeling better about the economy, more optimistic about inflation, the jobs market, and their own finances. Inflation has been coming down, so is the price of gas. Most Americans are probably feeling good about the election result since the majority of them got the party that they wanted. And don't get me wrong, I'm not ruling out the potential resurgence in inflation. I continue to believe, as I have done for a few months, that the risks are on the upside for inflation rather than the downsides for recession, as it stands at this point of time. Of course, we can't rule out either scenario, and it would truly be a Goldilocks scenario if the US economy continued to grow above 3% a year without the resurgence of inflation and the jobs market still holding up as well. That would be a really good continued soft landing. And we've never really quite seen global tariffs on the scale that's been proposed. So for sure, we don't know how that's going to play out, at least in the short term. But it's not just consumers in general, it's also investors in the market, certainly towards some assets like Tesla. Since the day before the election, even till today, after it pulled back a bit today, still up over 30% since the night before the election, as investors have warmed back up to the stock. So is the street potential to dominate autonomous technology, not to mention Optimus Bot. Really good quarter, better than expectation. And the prospect for a cheap Model 2 around the corner as well to compete with the cheap Chinese EVs. It's what I was thinking after the RoboTaxi event. Market kind of gave a muted response. But I knew the excitement was there. It was just coiling up, waiting for earnings. And then it uncoiled. And then again with the election, his all-in bet paid off and short sellers have taken it on the chin to the tune of $8 billion. However, there's still plenty of skepticism, not only on Tesla, but the entire market. Most economists out there hate the new incoming president. David Rosenberg, one of them. He thinks the euphoric post-election stock rally is disconnected from reality. And he's pointing to signs of weaknesses among businesses, the rise of zombie firms in recent years. He's saying investors are too optimistic about Trump's pro-business business policies. He's voiced concerns over this post-election rally and said there's too many zombie firms in the US, companies with high debt loads that don't generate enough revenue, kind of just like startups really with an idea. Other than that, doesn't really give much more of a material argument or substance other than he sees a lot of zombie firms. But one thing that could really test the market is if the Fed really changes their path cutting interest rates. We had a former Fed policymaker, Loretta Mista today, says the market's right and that the Fed is not going to have as many cuts next year as we assumed or expected, even just as recently as September, pointing to new global tariffs, in which it seems some policymakers are already assuming that's going to cause an increase in inflation. Jay Powell may be one of them. As I've been saying for a few months, he may start becoming a lot more concerned with inflation now, even though he seemed to have forgot about it. For a couple of months now, we could be on the cusp of a Fed flip-flop, which could test this stock market rally and potentially give us 10% pullback or so if the market has to recalibrate what the cost of capital expectations are going forward. However, if they were to come out on hold and indicate that, that would be a pivot from his long-held strategy of being data dependent, pretty much just swing trading the data month to month. If he starts coming out with a policy based on a vision, that would be a change in strategy for the Fed as well from their usual reactive stance to the data instead of proactive. I'd say a genuine risk to this rally is how China responds if they indeed get slapped with heavy tariffs. New administrations looking at a global 10, 20% tariff and potentially a 60% tariff on China. I doubt that'll be the final number. That's probably just a starting point in a negotiation. Could very well come down to who knows, 40, even 30%. I would expect maybe a global tariff of 10% and maybe 30% on China. However, China has a little leverage over America as well. If they really wanted to, they could go into Taiwan, cause a blockade, 
and without any military action to stop the export of advanced AI chips to America, which would cause big problems. Technology industry, many parts of society could come to a grinding halt, similar to the supply chain crunch we saw on COVID in chips, once the world woke up and realized how important and dependent we all are on semiconductor chips. If that were the case, companies like Apple and Nvidia would get smashed, especially Apple, which is heavily reliant on Taiwan and China, could become a key pawn if this trade war did get nasty. Chinese also have leverage when it comes to rare earth. Some of them, the Americans rely on China 100%. So it's really in the best interests for the two superpowers to work together in the long run. But in the short term, we could potentially see a bit of volatility Q1, Q2 next year as these tariff policies get enacted. Then we have to just wait and see if China's going to bite back. That's typically their strategy, looking at Chinese culture and the art of war. Typically what they like to do is match their opponent one for one. If the opponent does something, they'll match it and mirror it. And a lot of time, that's what they do as well. However, just looking at the Chinese economy itself, we just got good news of their singles day, the biggest online shopping day of the year over there in China. Hearing news from a data provider, 26.6% growth in single day sales, over 200 US billion dollars, as Chinese consumers also may be feeling a little bit more optimistic about their future given the huge government stimulus coming in. But just keep in mind, Nvidia and a lot of other American companies don't actually manufacture or fabricate all of their chips. They kind of outsource it to Taiwan Semi, which you could kind of think of as just a dedicated manufacturing and fabrication partner for a lot of these big companies. That's what they kind of positioned their whole business model on 30, 40 years ago. And so there is a tail risk there, China and Taiwan, to really knock over the semi trade. American tech companies, but I'd say that would be short lived because whatever happened should be quickly resolved. But we'll get to hear from Nvidia next Wednesday after close, which they should come through with a pretty good beat. We'll just see how the market reacts to that. Also just heard today from Home Depot. They beat on earnings, but the market didn't really give a good response to them. They've been holding up pretty well in a high interest rate environment. Typically consumers don't do big home renovations in that environment, nor has there been a lot of houses being getting sold, which typically encourages renovations. But third quarter EPS came in 378 above the 365 predicted, same with a beat on the top line as well. And they raised their full year guidance, now seeing sales growth of 4%. So all in all for the retailer, not a bad result, but the market put in a big bearish engulfing candle there. Not too excited, but it too could get caught up in the China risk as well, tariffs on imports. But again, that should encourage them to turn to domestic producers and manufacturers. Pretty good sign for the upcoming holiday season is online e-commerce is online e-commerce platform Shopify. And for those you don't know, Shopify is the largest e-commerce platform for websites. As a consumer, you've probably bought multiple products from Shopify run websites. So if you're a small, medium e-commerce website, you're selling products online, you'd integrate Shopify platform, load all your products, they accept payments for you, can integrate shipping, pretty much a whole back-end system for e-commerce operators. And so they came through with revenue well above expectation. In fact, their revenue for the third quarter is up 26% on the prior year. And they also lifted forward guidance as well. And like most digital platforms, they have really healthy profit margins with a net profit margin at 16% and the market loved the result up 21% today on monster volume and just going out to a monthly chart. This is one of these other beaten down high growth stocks from 2021. It actually bottomed out in 22 and has bounced quite a lot off that bottom. But that's a good sign for the growth area of the stock market and online retail sales as well as we go into the busiest period of the year. Which just looking at the retail sector ETF on the weekly chart frame actually appears to be breaking out of this box, which again is a bit contrarian considering the Chinese tariff risks. And an interesting ETF, long online short stores. It's a long short ETF. That's long online businesses, short physical stores. Got absolutely smashed in 22. That's rising back as well. Good signs for e-commerce sites. Now over to one sector I've been following, cannabis. Been absolutely smashed since the election. They had a ballot in Florida, which was rejected. However, it wasn't the best referendum as it prevented consumers from growing themselves. However, Florida is just one state out of 50. Let's not forget the incoming president actually came out in support of the initiative. Said he's met with cannabis CEOs. He's learned about it, sees the medical benefits. And along with RFK and Musk, I think it's actually highly likely they do legalize on a federal level, maybe sooner than we think, as a big part of this new administration's mandate and mission is to try and correct what they see as the prior administration's shortcomings and failings and do so in a swift manner. And it's good to see a longtime conservative like former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie saying that Trump will remove federal restrictions on marijuana and find a sweet spot for crypto regulation. This is news we just heard out today. He foresees the potential federal shifts and that we should get that descheduling which the DEA keeps kicking the can down the street. And if this new 
new administration does want to run a proper democracy as they've promised, well then 80% of Americans want this done. It shouldn't have to drag on for another four years. So I wouldn't be surprised if we wake up one morning in the coming months to big news that they're moving quick on this to get it done. And that news certainly caused some investors to buy the dip here. MSOS up 16% today. Keep in mind, this is a hugely volatile ETF and sector. In fact, the whole candle still below my buy sell bands here. DSI still negative 11, still very oversold even after today's bounce. I'm looking at a number of securities in this industry, one of which may become my next stock pick for members. However, either way, this could be setting up a big contrarian play at this point in time, and we may actually be putting in a low here. I think the bad news has already happened since the election. And since we're trading at all-time lows, we may be at rock bottom, and the only way to go is up. Because some of these companies are actually cash flow positive and trading at steep valuation discounts. Another stock I've been following, Up Fintech, also known as Tiger Brokers, just released their earnings today. Came in better than expected for the third quarter, ended September 30. Total revenue, 101 US million. That's year over year growth of 44%. That is monster. Net income, 17.8 million US. Big year over year growth. After they had some CapEx write offs this time last year. For the third quarter, they added 50,500 customers with deposits, more than doubled from a year ago. Total number of customers with deposits, a bit over a million now. And now their total account balance deposits with them up 115% year over year to US 40 billion. However, the market did not respond at all. Actually finished down 10% today. Even though we came in with that monster beat like I thought we would, I think it just got caught up in the China trade today, but actually came off quite a bit as well. Broke down to new monthly lows on FXI here as the market's probably nervous and uncertain about tariffs. Hence, we're going to see a bit of volatility for a few months here. However, as a long-term share holder myself, what I've learned after years is to stay more focused on the business instead of getting obsessed with the stock price and watching it tick for tick every day is instead follow the underlying business because quite often you'll see divergences between the stock price and the business. And so after today's result, I'm still happy to be a part owner of this business for many more years ahead. I'm enjoying their platform as a trader, discovering more things about it like Tiger AI, which is kind of like a customized GPT for investors. Really cool. So you can pretty much ask it anything about the market or a stock. For example, why did Shopify go up today? And then sort of read news and discussion and I'll give you in simple English some context and an answer, which is really handy as a trader and investor, just better talk with an AI bot and understand what's going on. So I actually really like the platform and I've seen a lot of different trading platforms. I actually run six of my own portfolios and their technology is up there with the best in the world in terms of what they offer traders and investors, all their data, visuals, analytics. I've had a chance to talk with support, which has been really responsive and they just offer multiple multiple assets from multiple exchanges. Just as a reminder, I have no affiliation with Tiger Brokers. I'm just a shareholder and a customer, just giving you my honest review of the platform. And they actually partnered with one of the biggest online brokers in the world, Interactive Brokers, who've made an investment in them, Thomas Pettifee, the richest man in Florida who created IB. From his own technology, he used on the floor back in the 70s, became Trader Workstation. And just looking at the valuation of Interactive Brokers, looking at their latest quarter, ending client equity of 540 billion. And looking at IB, currently got a market cap 75 billion. So in other words, 540 billion in client equity divided by 75 billion market cap is 7.2. So the multiple of their customer balance over their market cap is 7.2. And so just looking at Tiger Brokers, their total customer account balance 40.8 billion, which if we were to assign the same multiple the market did for Interactive Brokers, 40.8 billion divided by 7.2, that would imply a market cap of 5.66 billion, assuming the market valued every dollar of customer deposits with Tiger Brokers, they say they did as Interactive Brokers. Of course, IB deserves a premium, being in America much longer, stable brand. However, I would argue Tiger Brokers has a lot more upside and that should deserve a premium as well. But anyway, just doing a comparison valuation, that would imply Tiger Brokers fair value market cap if it was valued the same as IB at 5.66 billion. Market cap's currently just over 1 billion. And hence why I continue to believe it is at good value and I actually plan to keep buying a few more shares over the next couple of days, especially if we continue dipping down into the low fives. As a reminder, it's not financial advice. Please do your own research. I'm just sharing with you my opinion and position I have in this stock. And so we'll be keeping an eye on this one going forward. Another sector I'm interested in, space exploration. Taking off, exciting times going into the SpaceX IPO, hopefully in the next two, three years. Rocket Lab just announced their third quarter results. 55% year over year growth, also guiding to a record revenue in Q4. Revenue grew 55% to 105 million. They've seen strong demand with a backlog 
bit over a billion. So this company was actually started in New Zealand, now moved to California. They're also involved in rocket services, taking payloads up to space, and a lot of other things, space systems, spacecraft, space software, solar solutions. This is kind of the frontier of human development and advancement right here with SpaceX leading the charge. But there's a lot of other companies that are gonna play a role in this industry as well. And there's a look at Rocket Lab, which has been a rocket ship itself for the last couple of months, and especially after hours as I speak, up 24%, helping my position in the industry in Intuitive machines also trade up after hours as they too have been on a whole roll like the whole industry. And finally today, I thought I'd just end on a little interesting piece about why I think stock market bubbles and crashes are actually a good thing. I just recently heard it's actually a policymaker talking about how they could use policy to try and dampen market bubbles, if not prevent them. And so you often hear that this is a bubble, this is crazy, it's stupid, it needs to be stopped. Then when we get the crash, we hear the opposite. However, bubbles and crashes are a good thing because take for example, the NASDAQ bubble in the mid late 1990s. When the internet really took off, home PCs, consumers getting on the internet, businesses getting on there selling things, consumers buying things, communication's been taken to a whole new level. Investors got super excited, so much money poured into the market, so much money was raised because investors were sure the internet was gonna be a big thing. How could it not? It's gonna be around forever. For which they were actually right fundamentally, however valuations got so far ahead of themselves, it eventually reached a blow off top in the NASDAQ crashed 80% the next couple of years. However, it's through this bubble and excitement from investors and capital markets that allows them to raise a lot of capital Capital. investors don't really care so much about valuations so companies can invest they can innovate they can develop infrastructure and just like every previous bubble the railroad automobiles telephone you name it currently going through an AI one at the moment hundreds of companies spring up like back in the 1920s I think there was almost 500 automobile stocks on the New York Stock Exchange now the whole industry is pretty much four or five big ones in America so in other words it allows a whole lot of innovation new technology to be created companies can focus on growth innovation because that's what's really getting the market excited then something happens it could be any sort of catalyst it just reaches a crescendo money kind of looks at each other it gets to such a ridiculous valuation that the yield differential between other assets is so great or the fed starts increasing interest rates or we get a recession or whatever catalyst and then we get the crash and so the crash is good because that drives efficiency that weeds out all the weakest players only the strongest survive and industries see a lot of consolidation 80 percent of all internet companies got wiped out and the strongest like amazon and google survive and you see this in every industry automobiles, railroads, whatever new technology, get that bubble and crash. And so we very well could be doing it now with AI. And like I said, the market can go a lot further for longer than we think. There's the NASDAQ back in 95. Coming into 96, Alan Greenspan said, it was a time of irrational exuberance. NASDAQ index went from 700 up to almost 5,000 over the next five years. But it can catch even some of the smartest people in the world. Isaac Newton, one of the most brilliant humans to ever exist. Mathematician, physicist, laws of gravity, neutrons, light, pretty much created calculus you name it. He got caught up in the South Sea stock bubble back in London 300 years ago. A company that pretty much had a monopoly in government backing between trade, Africa, the Indies, and kind of one of the earliest and classic stories of a market bubble. Anyway, Newton invested in early 1720, made a bit of money, and he watched from the sidelines as the market went into a mania, new paradigm, everybody getting rich. He bought in, again, almost near the top with a lot of money, and he actually sold not even a year later, for which it almost bankrupted him. For which he left us with the brilliant quote, I can calculate the motion of heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people, referring to a stock market crowd. Fear and greed will always be part of the human fabric. And that's pretty much a wrap for the daily market review today, guys. Thanks very much for tuning in. We got CPI inflation data tomorrow with core expected to come in 3.3%. We'll see what we get there along with the market's reactions. And we may continue seeing a little bit of a pullback. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you again this time tomorrow. Cheers.